Hi, I'm David Nuttall, and some of you know me from my fictional maps, but today I'm going to talk about some real maps and the cartography as I was taught in the late 80s and early 90s. And this is not one of my maps, this is from the 1940s, so D-Day is not something I was around for. The chart that you now see um, is because I work at a place called Mapping and Charting Establishment, it's part of the Royal Engineers. So a chart was aeronautical versus a map being on the land. And I was a civilian within the British Army and trained by them to draw maps. And this talk is called Mapping Secrets. And no, I did not work at MI6. I didn't have this cool building to work in. I worked at this equally glamorous location in Feltham in West London. And this was Felton Garrison, and we knew it as Mapping and Charting Establishment, and it changed to be Military Survey, which was a um, slightly more accurate name. And we have our little mascot at the bottom, um, which is actually a Fugus creation. He was an editor and drawer for Punch, actually a Royal Engineer who was injured in the Second World War, and he drew our little um, military mascots carrying globes. This is a overview of Felton Garrison so you can see we actually have football pitches so it was quite a, a large location a lot of buildings um, some of which had no windows which I, I will get to and one of the buildings I went into my ID number was 003 so this is about secrets um, that number actually and that badge was only allowed inside the building we had to swap it to one that was outside the building and then that couldn't be seen by other people so there were a lot of things that we did within this very secure location that I can't still talk about. Um, and here's an example of secure fence. So this is a, a view that has now been published by the MOD because they are planning on actually selling this site off for housing development and moving the locations elsewhere. That building on the left-hand side is what was the training department. So spent an entire year in that building. And Here's a map, and this is an Ordnance Survey map that shows the location, but there's no names, there's no labels, it doesn't tell you what the location does, what the location is. And, and that was something that we were careful about when I worked there. You really didn't tell people what you did or where you went. And the police on the gate actually liked you to drive different directions and not use the same route all the time. I'm very grateful that I kept my training guide. So September 1986 um, is the end of my training. So I started in 1985 and had one full year of formal cartographic training. And I'm going to talk to you about some of what I learned during that. And at the same time, they send us to college. So one day a week, and yes, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. at Kingston College, um, we would go and learn some of the things, the more um, kind of some of it was weird, some of it was relevant, some of it was theory of cartography, some of it was um, more general communications, but that was a year um, formal and then two years of college. And I was lucky, I feel lucky, that at this time the British military still was manual. So I learned an entire process of production from start to finish. I didn't just learn one aspect. I didn't just learn how to do printmaking, or I didn't just learn how to do scribing. It wasn't a production line. And so I feel very lucky to do that. And once we had completed the training, we were assigned to a different location within the establishment. So that meant that you got a two year posting, if you will, to do a certain drawing office or work on certain maps or certain parts of the world. And that was kind of a fun way of not getting bored. I don't think that was their intent. I think that was their intent to just keep people moving around because it was military and you got military postings. So here's actually my very first thing in my training book. Um, so we learned repetitive shapes, repetitive um, features to draw on a map, everything by hand and um, with pens of varying widths. I still have some of my Rotring and my Faber-Castell pens. And if any of you guys used those in the past, you'll know that the rotaring pens, you often had to dismantle, take apart the end, rinse them out and stop them clogging up, even if you were using them constantly. Handwritten text and learning different fonts and how to, to write those was another early thing that we did. 
And then some people might be familiar with a stereoscope. And one of my favorite assignments was actually to review existing maps to look to see should they be updated? Should they have a new overlay of changes or should they go back into production and have a completely new edition done? And this was a, an important task because a new map would take six months. And that's from start to finish of extracting the data, getting all the information and going through all some all of the steps I'm going to talk to you about. I also love the stereograph because you could see 3D. So looking at aerial images, learning how to judge the height of buildings, learning what shadows really look like versus buildings and making sure that you actually understood what you're looking at. So that was actually one of the, the fun parts. The process included then extracting the data. And this is where, I don't know if it's famous, but infamous, the blob nib, blob nib pen um, comes into play. And this was a pen that you could adjust the width. You're drawing it nice and thick. And then you're reducing that in photographically to a positive and then changing that to a negative. And then you would move on to what was probably my favorite part of drawing maps manually was scribing. So, the scribing process is basically printing the layers of the map backwards, or at least you're printing them so that you're viewing the backwards because everything is upside down. So you're inverting the map in this image and then using a sapphire tipped scribing tripod. So that little plastic tripod, plastic so you can see through it, um, and you're following the lines that are on there to scribe them in an extremely accurate and the chisels could be single tip it could be double tip so you get road casings or it could actually be triple so some of the divided highways were scribing three lines simultaneously you can see some black ink on this image and that would be used to make sure that you got junctions correctly because obviously you're not going to start and stop scribing you're going to scribe through keep it as smooth as possible and then you can go back in with ink and make the, the updates. Ink also could be used if you made a mistake. If you veered off the line, you could fill in with ink, let it dry and go back and scribe over. The lines at the foreground, you can see where there's uh, some printing on the material and you can see some contours if you look closely. So everything on a light table. And this is where I was taught to work to 0 0.2 of a millimeter accuracy. A lot of people have seen some of the old scribing uh, plastics and they're used to seeing the orange versus the pink. So here's an example of both sides. You can see the orange layer in the bottom of the right view and then the, the back of it, which is what you actually scribe to remove that layer that you're basically letting light go through. Here's another example and the text you can see is backwards. So this is looking at the back. Another reason you might use ink is to change the type of line. So if you are scribing an international boundary or a dotted line or a, a dash line, you actually scribe the whole thing and then go back with ink and fill in the bits that you don't want. Also on the railway line, you can see the cross ties. They've got ink at the ends of them. That way you're making sure all the lines are the exact same width. And it's not, not like software where it does it automatically. You've got to plan where these go scribe them and then edit them all in that negative. And then here's that reverse view of the positive of that same thing. So you can see the, the railway ticks and some of the lines. Some of them aren't that good, but then I will claim that that's because I was still training at the time. Here's another view of the, the close up of the, the scribing tool. And the little feet were so smooth that it just glided and you could lock the, uh, chisel part in place and it was interchangeable with a tiny little allen key to swap out your prescribing and tips. One of the other things we learned to do was heel shading. So again, this is all manual, so it would be hand drawn, but then you can see there's four images here because you're taking what you draw and then converting it through the photographic process to a positive and then to a negative so that it was ready for the next phase. And all of this is done in layers. So unlike layers in Photoshop or layers in GIS in the table of contents, this was literal layers of plastic. And the only way to make sure that you were drawing in the right place was with registration. And the registration holes that you can see in this image would obviously have little registration pins in them. And 
that you had your own set. I don't know why we were very possessive. We had our own set each, and I think that was a, a trust thing. I know mine work, and you wouldn't use someone else's. And you could get probably 10 layers of film on this and still stay accurate. There was registration crosses as well and other registration tools, but using these pins and holes was the main way we kept everything straight. Text was interesting. So this is wax backed photographic text. So you would order your list of names and the size and the font from the different department and you'd come back with a sheet of text that you used a surgical scalpel to cut out and then place where you needed them and burnish them down with the other end of the scalpel. But where you needed them was extremely subjective and this was something that manual cartographers were very skilled at doing. To do something like this map, you would probably spend a week planning it. And that's a clear piece of plastic you box out with a pen everywhere that you think a name's gonna go and then you adjust. So obviously it depends on what is the most significant part. It depends on what features need to be more dominant and also avoiding having to break line work underneath. I happen to live in Adelston at the time. So that's why I chose this section of the West London map. Once you've got through all the positive stage, you then go on to negative. And there's two reasons that you would edit a negative. In this example, you can see the railway line is kind of that wine slash rusty color, and that's duffing fluid. Duffing is a great name. And that was what we used a paintbrush to go on the back of the negative and remove that feature. So this would be a reprint of a map that the railway line has been dismantled. You can see there's other blobs of the duffing fluid as well. So with the paintbrush, we are basically removing light dots. In the process of positive, negative, positive, negative, you can get flecks of dust, you can get light spots. So we would spend hours over the light table painting the back of the negatives to make sure no excess light came through because a dot of dust could easily look like a building. And then the printing process. On the right hand side is actually the black plate. That's a metal sheet that I still have. So that's just the black layer. On the left hand side is the final map that I produced as part of my training program. So Corsica and Sardinia. And you can see in the bottom right, there's actually the, the boxes that contain the layer information that were stuck onto each. And they don't register perfectly, but they didn't need to. The registration process on each side register perfectly. So the printing process could actually line everything up because they don't have those registration pins and registration holes in a metal plate. And I said there were some secrets. So this is actually my copy of the Official Secrets Act. I'm amazed I still have this. And so I signed this and this is for life. So there's certain things that I learned within the course of my work that I would never talk about. And there's certain things I've heard on TV where someone said something that I know is classified and I won't even deny it or mention it because I'm not allowed to. And when I left, I was actually given this list of restricted countries. So there were rules around which countries you could go to, which countries you couldn't, or for how long. So this is an interesting um, historical document because Yugoslavia is on there in 1996, which obviously is no longer a country. I didn't just draw the maps as I was told to. And when I went to my interview, I actually took hand-drawn maps. So those of you that know my artistic work, I make up places. So in my tea breaks, I continued to make up places. I was also in charge of, in one office, of the flat stock of Ordnance Survey 1 to 50,000 maps. And when I ordered new ones, I would draw on the old ones. So this is the River Severn in Western England going into Wales, and the Red Bridge is a bridge I created by editing, which was with you know, a whiteout fluid and then color pens and pencils. And I drew this new bridge. I'd heard that they were planning a seven bridge and I thought, oh, well, what if? And I drew it there. But this is the actual ordnance survey map where the new M4 bridge was built in the 90s. So about five years later, a bridge did appear. I wasn't too far off. Thankfully, I have a big box folder full of all these ordnance survey maps that I've edited. I have hundreds. Also in my tea breaks, I drew this. So this is an entire about four foot square map, Milbury. Um, there's a close up of the legend. All of that was handwritten. This was about 
an hour a day for a year. And in one corner of the map, everyone who worked in the office had a feature named after them. So they could request, do they want a town, a village, a highway interchange, whatever it was, they got something named after them. And then modernization happened or started to happen. Initially, it was just contours. The com massive computer used would look through the terrain and try and find some place of the same elevation and trace it around with a little light dot. And you end up with what we call auto cartography, which drew contours. And eventually that morphed and we needed more and more modern equipment and production process. So we went to a rather large secure building and it was actually a full screened building, meaning kind of went through an airlock to get into it and a lot of rules. One of the strange security rules was if there was a fire, you put away all your work first in the combination lock map drawers, make sure they were all secure before you left the building. To aid with that, several staff members were trained in firefighting, so they would have to deal with the fire before we could say the building was clear to allow the fire department in. So that's how secure some of this was. And this new modernization, basically, government thought we're spending a lot of money on these highly qualified cartographers can't we just have an operator that pushes a button and the GIS equivalent will just run through. I ended up having to give a demonstration to members of parliament and government ministers to prove you needed a person making decisions not just what they called a trained monkey. Uh, here's Google Earth view showing the rather large brick building about a football field for each floor no windows. Some of these processes you start and it ran for 24 hours so that was an interesting step they would also bring you a cue at the end of it that would say here's all the things i couldn't figure out you go figure it out and so humans had to actually make a lot of decisions it also caused the process to be broken up more and the software basically was early and pre the word gis or the term gis and this was something that evolved it wasn't all map drawing there's military survey football team. This was a charity day, not the fence in the background. So this was on site. We raised money for charities. I spent four hours trying to save penalty kicks that people paid to take. So that was a fun diversion. We'd also do athletics and sports. And then one of the weird trips I got was I won the lottery, internal MOD, and I got to go watch a live firepower demonstration. And of course, the town that this is in is called Warminster. And this last photo just looks like I'm on a battlefield and shouldn't be there. This is the first time I've shown these photos. I was amazed I was allowed to take photos and this is the result. So to me, cartography is still, as the definition says, the art and science of, of creating a 2D version of our world. And I think that it is just as important today that you have skilled cartographers who know what they're doing, who understand the aesthetics, who understand how to create something that's unambiguous. And it's even more important. The data we have now is way more than I had when I started doing this. And the software is just better and better. So here's an example of one of my maps that's in the map gallery online this year. And you can see this is hand-drawn. So this is my artwork, but it references the level of detail that I was taught and here is also my contact info. So if anyone would like to shoot me a message or reach out to me through the Slack channel, please do so and I'll answer any questions you have. Thank you very much.